Um, we're getting to, well, we're in the book of Acts, and we're continuing on in our, in our series, and today we're in Acts 2, but I thought I'd show a video to start just of what church could be like. So Izzy, do you have that video ready to go? Imagine a church where every member is passionately, wholeheartedly, and recklessly calling the shots. I don't know who sets the worship center temperature, but why does it have to be so cold? Why do you have to be so right? Heated chairs are now being installed. This one wants a small church, but I'm afraid if it's too small, they're going to make me volunteer like crazy. I'll say cheers. <laughs> Makes total sense. Join now and we'll let you decide the size of our church. We're millennials, and we want a church to say no more. Any requests you have will be granted immediately. Parking is horrible. It takes me almost six minutes to get from my car to the building. Oh. It's going to take me six seconds to tell you a family service is on the way. <laughs> My pastor's preaching. It's all over the map. I say, oh, I don't know. Stick with the books of the Bible. We should be only Exodus Jesus. Okay. Oh. Next week, we start John chapter 1, verse 1. And we'll even start pronouncing that word the way you said it. The yeah, like this sermon to be no longer than 30 minutes. How does 15 minutes sound? Hey, anybody willing to go 15 should be willing to go 10. <laughs> you drive a hard work. But from now on, five minute sermons it is. <laughs> now you're talking. <laughs> Me, church, where it's all about you. I like your seat. We're not going to have heated chairs, maybe AC chairs, in the next little while. Um, but I'm sure you've never thought any of those thoughts before. Um, but I want, to, I want you to think about what your ideal church would look like. And as you're thinking about that, I'd like you just to shout out some of those thoughts that come into your head. What is the ideal church? What does your ideal church look like? What are some characteristics of that church? Shout it out so everyone, everyone can hear Forest. Sorry? In the forest. In the forest. <laughs> Friendly. Friendly. Yeah. Too many people wanting to serve. Too many people wanting to serve. <laughs> That's a good one. Amen. Kids workers. Lots of kid workers. I heard redemptive community, I didn't hear the first part. Genuine. Genuine. Um, great. Like community outreach. Community outreach. Prayer. Prayer. These are great characteristics. These are. I'm not sure what the forest one. We'll let Randall explain a little bit later on. But, um, <laughs> but everyone here has a, has a vision of, of what they would like in a church. And you know, our preferences kind of, you know, kind of show that. And if you think of what your church is like, chances are it may be like similar to what we're going to read here first in Acts today, in Acts chapter 2. And whether, whether you've read these verses or not, uh, this, this ideal church, um, this is an ideal church, because we all want to be part of community in some way. Because community is marked by, by joy, by happiness where people are actually excited to be together. We want to be part of a community where you're welcomed in, and yet being part of that community makes you want to become a better person in Christ. And as a believer of Christ, in Christ, we want to be part of a community where there's a sense of awe, as it shows in these verses, where Christ is present, people are coming to faith, and where you can see real life change happen. So let's read Acts 2. We're going to read chapters, or Acts Acts 2, 42 to 47. But before we get there, before we get there, 
all these amazing things that we're going to read in, in verses 42 to 47 comes from 1 verse 8. And it's, in, in 1 verse 8 it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When we realize that, the Holy Spirit is doing all these amazing things. That's what we need to realize. We can't forget that important fact in Acts 1 verse 8. When you, but you will receive the Holy Spirit receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And it continues on, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. So let's read our verses here this morning. Starting in 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So I want to look at this morning few points. What does this church look like? What are they doing right? What is it that keeps us from having this? And then how do we get this? So first off, in verse 42, it was a learning church. So they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They spent the last 40 days or so with Jesus, listening and learning from Jesus after he rose from the dead. What did Jesus come to do? Well, they were learning that. They were learning... So this is the apostles' teaching. As a church, you know, we want to be a spirit, a spirit-filled church. And if we're that, if we're truly a spirit-filled church, then we're a word-filled church as well. We're committed to the Bible. We want to know the Bible and what this means. And this means to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. This is the church in our minds, what we want. In our heads, our ideal church should be committed to learning something. We want to be part of, a, part of a church where there's truth being taught week in, week out. A sense of learning is happening so we can understand what God is saying to us through the Bible. And the same can be said if you're not a believer here this morning. You want a place where you can come and have a chance for your questions to be answered, your doubts to be acknowledged, and where you can know what Christians really believe. So this church is a learning church. And as Luke is writing here in Acts, and when you turn to the last three letters that Paul wrote to his younger pastors, Timothy and Titus, you find him emphasizing again and again the need for sound doctrine. In 1 Timothy 4.13, in 16, in Titus 1.9, in his final appeal to Timothy, just before he's martyred, Paul gives the strongest possible admonition of this. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge you the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. 2 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. He goes on to warn Timothy that the time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine, but will accumulate teachers who tell them what they want to hear. And if you think about that this morning, what people want to hear, this is so prevalent in our society today. It is so prevalent in different churches that we see, that we hear. Um, it's so prevalent in, in different ministries where biblical truth is not being preached. What you hear is possibly a watered-down version of maybe what the Bible teaches. Or what you hear is um, not truth at all. As Mark was saying before, just different things that, you know, as, as Reach Tanzania is, is doing these courses, they're preaching truth so that we can know truth in our own lives. And so when you know the word, then you can tell if, if what you're hearing is truth or not. So an amazing opportunity. I'm just going to make another plug for Mark as well. Again, an amazing opportunity. If you have time to do this, great. Do it. Be able to be, be part of learning the word. So this church was a learning church. Uh, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Secondly, it was a loving church. They were devoted to fellowship. And I know fellowship is a really overused word that people may not even like. 
Um, but let's not miss its purpose, though. They were continually devoting themselves to fellowship in, in verse 42. In verse 42. So what does it mean to be devoted to fellowship? Well, it's a word, the Greek word means to share in common, which is koinonia, which is a word you may have heard before. So we read in verse 44 that all those who believe were together and had all things in common. The Greek word translated together is repeated when it states the Lord was adding, the Lord is adding to their number those who were being saved in verse 47. So there's a sense of togetherness when it says that they were of one mind and they took their meals together. So being devoted to fellowship is a commitment to be built together with those who join God's family by being saved. There's some aspects that I want to look at. To have fellowship, we must be together. You can't have fellowship within the church or with people if you don't show up. If you don't gather within the church. And I know some people object to large churches as being too impersonal, and we need to remember that as well, how the Lord started the church was with 3,000 believers on the first day. That's a, that's a good day. And soon after that, it numbered to 5,000, as we see in chapter 4. And it kept growing from there in chapter 5 and chapter 6. And while we should gather together like this, for worship, for teaching, for prayer, we only enjoy deep fellowship, deep fellowship when we get together with those personally. If we only attend the morning service and expect so many things from church, we may not ever get that deep fellowship that we're looking for. If we're not spending time in people's houses after the service, or like the men's barbecue yesterday, if we're not spending time in those types of settings, we're not going to know people on a deeper level. We're not going to enjoy that deep fellowship that God has intended us to have. House to house, in a restaurant, wherever. Life group, and I know we've said life group a lot. And maybe some people are, are, are tired of hearing the word life group, but when life group works well, it is an amazing setting to get to know people on a deep level. That's some really true fellowship right there. To have fellowship, we must share in the things of God. So there's something to be said for food and fellowship going together. And these early Christians were taking their meals together and they were enjoying communion together. And if you wait to have people over at your house, when you know when things are perfect, placemat, everything is set up nice, the food is ready to go. If you're waiting for everything to be perfect, it's not going to happen. I was talking to Trudy, who's not here. Uh, I was talking to Trudy a little while ago about this, and she was saying, <coughs> it's not really a big deal whether or not, and I, and I agree with this, it's not a big deal whether or not it's some fancy food, or if the house is clean, I could care less. I really could care less. But the fact that people are inviting people over and the conversation around this time is the most important thing, and I probably couldn't even tell you what I ate at people's houses half the time. But I remember the conversation and I remember the fellowship we had afterwards or during that was the that was the main point. <clears throat> to have fellowship, we also must share in the material things as well. Verses 44 and 45 of this passage is not prescribing communal living. We not this isn't a command for God's people in every situation. You know, the Bible recognizes the right to have personal property and the right for families to be distinct. And I think the situation in Jerusalem was somewhat unique where you have thousands of people there for the Feast of Pentecost. Many have been saved after Peter's message. And they want to stay long, they want to stay longer, get grounded in their new faith. So what they needed was they needed hospitality. They needed financial help to do this. To meet these needs, the church opened up their homes. They opened up their pocketbooks for different needs, to help the needy. They, some even sold land and donated the proceeds. They were doing all these things because there was need in the community. And there's so many needs, even in our community as well, and I'll share some later on, just some amazing things that we're a part of here. You may not realize it or not, but there's a really, really cool, amazing thing that God is doing in and amongst our community that has to do with fellowship. 
So a healthy church is marked by continual devotion to the Lord and His people. And this is kind of the church we want. Right? And even if, again, if you're not a believer here this morning, this is what you want. You don't want a church where all we do is talk about Jesus and do nothing about it. You want, some, you want a church where there's some action. You want a church where your faith is getting lived out. We can preach all the time, and yet if we're not living these things out, that's not the point of things. So we want a church where action is happening. Thirdly, it was a worshiping church. So this church was committed to, devoted to breaking of bread into prayer. And this is describing what we're doing here this morning. This is a formal gathering of our worship. Uh, later on, we'll be joining together and having communion together. And we're eating in others' homes. It's important. It's very, very important. And in verse 46, this was saying it's an everyday thing. It's an everyday thing eating meals together, having communion together. So there's no surprise when we go back a few verses in 43 where it says that everyone was filled with awe. There was a sense that this is real, that God himself is there present amongst them. And deep down we want a church where God shows up, where there's a sense of God among us. And again, if you're not here, a believer here this morning, you want to be part of a church where you can feel the presence of God and not just a bunch of people gathering in a room. You want to be able to feel that presence. You want to know, like, yes, God is here with us. We want, a part, we want, we want that part of that in our, in our church life. Fourthly, it was an evangelistic, evangelistic church, verse 47. And I know the first three points are more maybe... Uh, inward focused uh, on our, maybe a personal walk or the interior part of the church and many sermons have been preached on verse 42 alone that's an important verse but it's also important to include verse 47 as well as part of this because they were not so inward focused that they only focused on themselves and they forgot about witnessing that was part of things yes but in verse 47 the Lord is adding to the number daily. So what does that have to What is that? That means there was a daily evangelism of some sort. We don't know exactly what was going on, but this was happening daily. They had to have done it if their numbers were being added daily. They were an evangelistic church. And it's interesting because what it says is the Lord added to that number. The Lord added to that number. And the important thing is that the Lord did it. And many times we think that our efforts are going to bring people to Christ. We have our part in it. We have our part to, to evangelize. We have our part for bringing the, the gospel to different places. We have our part. But who's going to do that? The Lord's going to end up doing that. The Holy Spirit is going to convict people of their sins. That's part of his job. So we can do all these great things um, but we got to watch out because pride might be getting in the way. But who's going to bring people across that line of faith? It's the Holy Spirit. So the Lord added to that number. And there's a dailyness of it, of this. This is real live conversion. God was adding to their number. This is the Holy Spirit convicting people of their sin to reveal to them that they stand under a righteous God and move them to trust in Jesus for their salvation. So this church was evangelistic, it was worshiping, it was uh, it was a loving church, and it was a learning church. So what keeps us from maybe ha having this type of church? And I'm not saying we don't have this, but what keeps us from having, in verses 42 to 47, why do we not sometimes have this? I think part of it is because they devoted themselves. This wasn't accidental. They gave themselves to this. You know, I think there's a, a lie that Satan gives us where that perfect church is out there somewhere, and if we um, leave here because of whatever reason and go somewhere else and try to find it, or go somewhere else and try to find it, chances are we're not going to end up finding this perfect church. And so the church here was living, and they devoted themselves to these things. 
In college, I, I learned to ride the unicycle. And um, it wasn't really by choice, I guess. And I didn't really see the point of it because my friends, my friends somehow got into this unicycle thing. One wheel bicycle, well, not a one wheel, can't call it bicycle, because <laughs> that would be two wheels. One wheel. So I'm like, they, they, they were going and they were having great fun with it, and I just never, I never really understood the, the lure of a one wheeled thing. And so, um, they were riding and they're like, hey, you know, come on, come on. And I'm like, no, I have no interest in learning how to ride the unicycle. So um, one day, it was, my, it was my birthday. They'd been riding for a number of months. And I was not jealous in any way. I was like, you guys can have your unicycle thing. <laughs> so one day, they, they bought me a really, really nice unicycle. Like, it was nice. And I was like, oh, OK. Guys, I see what you're doing here. Um, I couldn't just let it sit in the corner. It was actually it was quite nice. And so, over the next weeks and months, I, I devoted myself. Like, I've devoted very few things in my life. I devoted to learning this thing. I was like, fine, I'm going to do this. And I actually learned how to ride the unicycle pretty good. It's up in my office, actually, because um, there's some nice ramps you can go along in the school here. But um, I devoted myself hard towards this, and eventually we became a, a unicycle gang in our, in our college, and, and we were... Feared, but um, but it goes to show just like this, being devoted to something, and these guys were devoted to these things, evangelism, to worship, fellowship. And I was thinking, can we think about how we lack devotion? How are we lacking devotion to the apostles' teaching? What would it really look like if we were to study and read the Word of God, meditate on it? Study it. Read it with your kids. What would it mean to fellowship with each other? Not just, I'm with you in this until you maybe offend me and then I'm gone. But when we're really devoted each other, to each other, working things out together and being in it for the long haul, what would that look like? What would it mean if we're devoted to breaking, breaking of bread and prayers on Sundays and outside of Sunday? What would that look like? That might actually be committing to being here on Sundays week in, week out, not once a month. Committing to come to life group. What would that look like? Committing to coming to prayer meetings when we have prayer meetings. What would that look like? What would it look like if we were all fully devoted to these things? And I'm not saying I'm perfect because... I've struggled with a lot of these things as well. But what would that look like? How would that look like as a church if we were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to worship, breaking of bread and prayer on Sundays and outside of it? What would that really look like? So they're not only devoting themselves, but I think a key is also found in verse 43. And it says that awe came upon everyone. A joyful, trembling sense of awe and sometimes I think this is not our experience. Today, for most pe people, including professing Christians, God is an idea to talk about. Um, maybe an inference for an argument. Maybe a family tradition to be preserved. But very few people, is God a stark, fearsome, stunning, awesome, present reality? To a lot of us, he's tame. He's distant. He's silent. Where are the churches of whom Luke could say today, fear, awe, wonder, trembling is upon every soul? What would that look like? That would be amazing. And my prayer is that our church can be the like the loving, supportive, generous community of the church, early church in Acts. And maybe like this early church in Acts. The Lord will add it to our number daily, those who are being saved. And he's doing that. He's doing some amazing things in our midst. So how do we do this today? Rick Warren, which some of you have heard, some of you have read his book, uh, Purpose Driven Life, and he goes on to say, um, he gives some 
great advice in regards to purpose uh, in our lives. And I was looking at these purposes, and when we have these purposes, if we were to fully have these purposes in our lives, then what this first church was doing would be so, so natural. It says, your first purpose is to offer real worship. So we are planned for God's pleasure. The second purpose that he gives is to enjoy real fellowship. So we are formed for God's family. Our third purpose is to learn real discipleship. Because we were created to become like Christ. Are you happy at all, Izzy? The fourth purpose we have is to practice real ministry. Because we are shaped for serving God. And the fifth purpose he gives is to live out real evangelism. Because we are made for mission. And he gives this in his book. And he says, when we get these purposes, when we get these... We begin to prioritize our lives from them and not to them. Too often we get these things turned around. We make plans and hope that we find out what our priorities are or somehow discover what our purpose in life is. If we're a believer here this morning, this is our purpose. If we have these as our purpose, then all these other things will just flow naturally. So we have our purposes. And so how is this going? How is this going? Sometimes when I look and really think about these purposes uh, and how they apply in my life and think what I'm doing well, I'm like, oh, I'm doing that one well, I'm doing that one well, eh, this one not so well. But the ones I'm doing well, I begin, like, I begin to see and begin to get a little bit prideful in my heart sometimes. So I've got to watch out for that. Or sometimes the opposite can happen. Maybe we're, we're not doing well in one of these or, or two of these or something like that. And then guilt can settle in. So the issue is the good and the bad we might be seeing sometimes in ourselves points us to what we are worshiping more than God. What are we prior prioritizing that causes our hearts to be drawn to something other than Christ? So why why did the church grow? How can we be like this? Well, I think we need to show devotion to this. Are we devoted to, as, as a group of believers, are we devoted to these things as a church? Are we here week in, week out? That's one of the, that's, that's showing devotion. You know, do we show up for church? Maybe sometimes we hear about the prayer meeting is happening and we're like, nah, that's not for me. Or we hear about life group and we're like, mm, no, I don't want any part of that. Or we hear of all these things happening and we expect, we expect things from the church, but we're not really willing to do any of these things ourselves, are we sometimes? So the day before this church started, there was 3,000 new believers. That's a good day. That's a really good day. You know, what do we do then? We do all these things like in verses 42 to 47. This church wasn't perfect, but it did have a lot of great things going for it that we can apply to us today. Now at this point, you know, this is kind of set up as a, as a good moralistic sermon and, you know, you know, the reason we don't have these things sometimes is because maybe we're not devoted, so we'd be more devoted. But if we were to he leave here now, we might be maybe a little more dis discouraged and wonder what could we do better. So the answer is, in some cases we need to be more devoted, but what causes us to do that? What causes us to do this? How does this become normal? And I think the answer is found all throughout Scripture when we see how God has devoted himself to us. And when we see how God devotes himself to us, wow, that is, you know, we see it. That's, that's, that's joy, happiness that moves us to want to give ourselves more fully to him. In Romans 5.8, it says, while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. Before we had any desire to devote ourselves to God, God devoted himself to us. Despite our half-hearted devotion to him currently, he still devotes himself to us. Despite our lack of obedience, despite our, our rebellion towards him, 
he's still committed to us. And what do we see in Acts so far? We see a group of half-hearted guys, timid, fearful disciples, who knew Jesus rose from the dead, but are unsure of what to do next. These guys are the model of courage, godliness, and they all ran away when Jesus was crucified. But what does Jesus do? You guys, who were all these things, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, and I am devoted to you. Despite these things, I remain devoted to you. And here's the evidence. The Holy Spirit. Why was the church devoted to the apostles' teaching, breaking of bread into prayer? Because they were so convinced of God's devotion towards them. Out of love, joy, freedom, they devoted themselves to these things. They were marked by radical generosity. They had no doubt that God was for them. Sometimes we have more doubts that God is for us, that God is committed to us, that God is devoted to us to us. We have more doubt sometimes because sometimes we see God as a bit distant, as a bit silent. That's what gives life meaning joining the church, by seeing God's devotion to us and then in turn loving him so much that we do these things. And this is the type of church that the Holy Spirit is building today. He's building this church today. Acts 2 wasn't just for then but it's to do what we're doing right now in our midst. There's a few short stories that I want to just share what's happening in our in our church today that some of you may know, some of you may not know. But it's it's cool to see how these things that, that are in Acts 2 are happening in God's tribe. And they're happening in other, in other churches around the city as well. But if you know Kath... Uh, Tala and Karen Lee, they have this ministry to um, the streets of Senza for for the girls there. And recently, one of the girls from there got saved and got her off the street. And uh, there were a lot of practical needs, financial, clothing, just different practical needs that this girl had. And a few WhatsApp messages later on, what happens? The women, a lot of women in our church, came together and were giving things to this girl. So this girl now has the set. This is, this is what we see in Acts right here. They were giving generously. A lot of women in here, possibly, I don't know, may have given to this cause, to this girl, to get her off the street, to get her some of these basic necessities that, um, that she needs. And now she sees the church as, oh, the church is actually relevant today. There's needs to be met. My needs were met. This is happening. Recently in our God's Tribe Brotherhood, um, a brother had a, an educational need where um, money was needed for education, and within a few days, you know, people came together and covered this guy's need for education for, I think it was the next term. But that is, that's it, that's living in community, that's living with each other in community. When we went home this past May, uh, members of our life group in our church gave us gifts to give our parents back home. I would never have think I would never think of giving my friend a gift for their parent back home. But this happened on multiple occasions where our group, life group members stepped up, a couple of them, and said, "Hey, give this to your parents back home." And I was like, "Wow, that's a really really cool gift." And then on, on coming back in August, we were just totally blown away that, again, members in our life group, members in the church here, were just like, hey, we know you just got back, here's a meal, here's a meal, here's a meal, here's a meal. And our first four or five days were covered for meals as, as coming back. Um, that is this Acts 2 church being lived out amongst us. And there's many other stories that you guys may have of amazing things that are going on in our church. Um, we're not a perfect church. We're not. But we're doing some great things for God, and God is expanding His kingdom, and we need to remind, remember us, remind ourselves of that. But we do need to be devoted to these things. We need to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Read the Word. Have fellowship with others. Be committed to coming to certain things on Sundays, outside of Sundays. When those things happen, you begin to experience fellowship 
with people that God, how God intended it to be. So amazing things can happen from that. So Acts 2, a great, a great example for us uh, today as we look at church. And so in a few moments we'll take up communion together. And so I'm just going to give you a chance just to um, quiet your hearts now, just to remember what God, what Jesus did for us on the cross, how he died and rose again for us. And then um, we'll take up our our communion in in a few moments. As we did last time with uh, with communion, we'll we'll stay seated. The ushers will come up and we'll kind of distribute things left and right. And then... um, We'll get going in in a few minutes after that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you that you are committed to us, Lord. Even though we have done so many things to not show our commitment, our devotion to you, but Lord, you have never wavered in that. We thank you for that, Jesus. Lord, help us to be uh, a church like in Acts 2 who are devoted to these things who have a sense of awe that you were there, you were doing things things in our midst. Lord, we thank you for, for these. We thank you for how you are moving your church. We thank you that um, there are so many of us here who, have, who are doing some great things for the kingdom, Lord. We just thank you for that. We pray these things, Lord, in your name. Amen.